Hello, welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I'm talking with Jonathan Marks. Jonathan is the department chair and professor of politics at Ursinus College, where he teaches political philosophy. He is the author of the new book, Let's Be Reasonable, a conservative case for liberal education. He's also written for the Chronicle of Higher Education, the Wall Street Journal, and a contributor to Commentary Magazine. In this episode, we focus mostly on his new book. Uh, we begin by talking about his background and his main thesis of his book. We give a definition of what liberal education is for him. We talk about some of the origins of liberal education and some of the American version of, of liberal education as opposed to maybe a British version or, or others in Western Europe. We talk about how he defines the terms liberal and conservative and why it's important to defend liberal arts education. Uh, the main thesis of his book and the main thing in which he talks about in the conversation is rationality and why this is such an important ingredient for maintaining liberal education. Um, he also talks about why that's important for educational institutions overall. Uh, he, we, we talk about how rationality influences and impacts pragmatic aspects of life. Uh, we talk about how to develop a robust and integrative curriculum for students. And towards the end, we talk about some of these more common, I guess you could say, fads of this kind of DIY educational learning and um, what the future of educational institutions are uh, going forward. I have to say, this is a great conversation with Jonathan. He's a, he's a wonderful, wonderful guy, really, really smart. And it was really, really nice to talk about not only his book and the ideas in the book, but, you know, how this applies for many of the problems going on today. And, and I think he, his emphasis on rationality, his emphasis on maintaining good uh, institutions that are teaching, um, you know, the humanities and a liberal arts education is really, really important. And um, I, I can't recommend his book um, highly enough. It's a fantastic book. And um, I hope that everyone is able to pick it up. And so now I bring you Jonathan Marks. I'm here with Jonathan Marks. Jonathan, thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you, Xavier. Let's <laughs> converge. <laughs> um, uh, you have written a, a great book, uh, Let's Be Reasonable, A Conservative Case for Liberal Education. Now, I got to ask, did you come up with the subtitle? It's real catchy. It's a good subtitle. It's a really like, hmm, that's a thoughtful subtitle. Did you come up with it? No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, in man. Fact, in, in fact, I didn't. A friend of mine suggested it. It's really me. good. Very good. Said, Isn't this really what you're talking about? Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, that's pretty catchy. Yeah, it's great. Um, well, tell folks just a little bit of who you are, what you do, what your background is, and then we'll, uh, we'll get into the book. Sure. I, I teach at Ursinus College. Um, go Bears. <laughs> You're in uh, southeastern Pennsylvania in a town aptly known as Collegeville. I've been teaching here since 2006, and I've been in the teaching biz for about 20 years. I, I teach uh, in a politics department here. My area is political philosophy. Mm -hmm. Um, and that means that I teach um, courses uh, mostly in uh, writers in the uh, classic political tradition. So my introductory course, for example, is about Plato, Aristotle, Machiavelli, folks like that, as well as contemporary, as well as contemporary uh, mm -hmm. writers. But I do have a certain focus on on writers like that. I teach some American thought as well, and I teach in our our uh, first year program here called the uh, common intellectual experience. Yeah, no, that's great. I, it's, uh, we have a, a mutual friend, uh, Stephen Klaus. I think you've been on his podcast. He's been on mine a sure. few times. He is a great, great guy. And anytime I have any doubts or questions about anything regarding Aristotle, I just, uh, <laughs> I just send him a message and say, okay, correct me on this or help me out. And so he usually obliges. So he's great. Everyone yes, he's, he's, he's a lovely man. The only thing I'd add is, is that I also um, sometimes take off my scholar's cap and uh -huh. write for publications like Commentary Magazine, where yeah. I 
blog regularly. So if anybody can't get enough, um, <laughs> you, you, you can find more me there. No, that's great. Well, I was going to say, uh, the book reads very, it's, a, I think it's a pretty digestible read. It's not too heady. It's not too dense, but it's not too casual and it's not very long. So I think it's, I think it's great. So I think, uh, if folks don't get, you, get enough of you there, yeah, commentary is a, it's a nice place. You wrote a recent piece for that as well, right? As I think uh, after the book. That's book. right, on the, yeah. on the Great Boulder Incident <laughs> at the yeah. University yeah. of Wisconsin-Madison. Yes, I, I write for them pretty regularly. Yeah, and I, I, I do give, just as I gave credit for the subtitle, but here I can give credit uh, uh, by name. Um, I, I had a lot of help uh, editing uh, my writing, uh, my editor, Peter Doherty helped me a lot, but my uh, spouse, Anna, also read the entire manuscript and uh, yeah. prevented me from making the very worst of my dad jokes and committing other uh, <laughs> blunders of um, excessive glibness or excessive abstractness. So um, she was a great help. That's great. That's great. So uh, getting into the book. So I guess the first thing off the top of my head is you know, you're talking about the conservative case for liberal education, and you talk about liberalism and liberal education, you know, pretty extensively. How do you define uh, liberal education, I guess, in a general sense? Uh, and then, you know, how does that, uh, you know, how does that align with what we think about liberal education today? Is it misaligned or, or correctly aligned? Or so maybe just give us a definition and, and how it aligns or doesn't with today's. Uh, ideas of it. Sure, I'm happy to. Liberal education in the most general way is education for freedom. And that has two different aspects, I think, that run throughout the tradition of liberal education. One, one is political. What are the educational prerequisites of being a free citizen? Mm. And then there's a, a transpolitical meaning. Um, which comes down to uh, how can I be free um, in a manner uh, outside of the parameters of the polity I happen to sit in? Mm -hmm. um, so there's a kind of court of appeal, you might say, mm -hmm. um, above any given polity with respect to my freedom. Um, and that authority is, would often be said in the tradition of liberal education to be reason. Mm -hmm. I define it more specifically because there are so many different ways of defining liberal education. And so my book argues, right, it's called Let's Be Reasonable. Mm -hmm. And so liberal education consists in the shaping of reasonable people. And that means maybe especially combating our partialness. John Locke is a thinker I draw on, right, 17th century political and educational theorist. And one of the things he says um, in his educational writings is we see but in part and we know but in part, and therefore it's no wonder that we judge not right mm -hmm. from our partial views. And his antidote to that is what he calls comprehensive enlargement of mind, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And how do you get comprehensive enlargement of mind? Um, you do it by uh, putting yourself in the presence of the best exponents uh, of different views. Um, you put yourself into the presence of people who, whether you think they come up to you in stature or not, have different experience than the experience you have, and so you can benefit from it. Um, you get comprehensive, comprehensiveness of uh, mind, comprehensive enlargement of mind by um, considering sciences than the ones other than the ones you study or familiar with. Uh, ways and approaches of looking at the world other than the ones that you're most um, familiar with, and, and so on. And, and so as you go through the different things that are needed for comprehensive enlargement of mind, you begin to get at something that looks a bit like um, a modern liberal arts education, right? So, for example, um, different ways of knowing and approaches, right? That there are those distribution requirements you find <laughs> um, at your liberal arts school, right? A bit of humanities, a bit of um, natural sciences. The way I don't think it quite fits is, is that um, our, our justification for liberal education is, is quite spotty. And even if you ask someone who's seeking to work at a liberal arts institution or institution to vote to liberal education, 
uh, well, why do you want to be here? They'll often say, well, I hear the classes are small. Um, you know, it's good to be well-rounded and, and discuss things. And um, so, so I think that that liberal education, um, although there are some very good defenders of it who I talk about some in my book, uh, is often lacking a, a compelling, coherent justification other than, well, it's good to be well-rounded. And I'm not even 100% sure what that means or whether it's good. Mm -hmm. So from the historical perspective that you're laying out, you're saying, you know, there's an emphasis on rationality and reason, there's an emphasis on freedom, there's an emphasis on really expanding your knowledge base. Um, being well rounded is incomplete, right? It's a, it's a, maybe a fine starting point to have some exposure, I guess, to some of these uh, types of, uh, I guess you could say interdisciplinary kind of uh, domains, but it, it seems like the liberal education is, in in the truest historic sense, is much more than that, you know. And so maybe from maybe uh, a liberal arts school, let's say, you know, currently, where is it missing the mark? Where is it not quite getting to the essence of what we historically know as liberal education? It, it sounds like it's, it's part of it, but not completely. Yeah, well, I, I mean, they have a a number of different worries, I guess, about the way that we think of liberal education. And one is the one that I just named, um, that there's a confusion with regard to justification. You see, even institutional defenders of liberal education, um, for example, the um, Association of American Colleges and Universities is probably the premier defender of what's called liberal arts education sure. in the country. And if you look at what they say about liberal education, it's as if they're flinging things at a wall to see if anything's going to stick. So, you know, it's so, well, you know, we've got skills. Um, we've got um, uh, racial healing. Um, and, uh, you know, we've got jobs, jobs, jobs. and you know, where we're interdisciplinary and sustainable and, you know, just running up flag after flag after flag. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think what's what's lacking is, is a, in a lot of ways, unity of purpose. Mm -hmm. I, I, that resonates. I guess the only, I guess you could say, if you if I want to play devil's advocate, you're like, well, I mean, maybe there, there's obviously, you know, political and, you know, uh, kinds of ways I would imagine that they you know, ratchet up those kinds of flags to say we have this and this and this, but wouldn't that just be a way of trying to have liberal education in a pragmatic way in 21st century? Well, you have to know how to get a job afterwards. You have to know how to, you know, have something tangible for when you leave education and prepare. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be enough or, but you're saying no. And so you know, just to play devil's advocate here, how, how sure, would that work? Sure, yeah. Work? I, I love a little bit of devil's advocacy, which I think <laughs> is very much in the spirit of, of, of liberal education. And, and I think that's right. That is to say that, that, that there is a lack of unity of purpose, you might say, stems to some extent from all the different things that universities are expected to do mm -hmm. um, in our society. Mm -hmm. um, there are expected to be, though I'm not sure they are, our premier civic educators. Mm -hmm. um, they're expected to be our premier job getters. They're expected to be credentialers. Mm -hmm. um, many people expect them to be engines of social justice um, and so on. So th there are a lot of purposes um, out there. And, and I don't think that's, that's a problem. That is to say, I'm, I'm, I'm not a purist. Sure. Yeah. Um, about these things. I remember talking to uh, an outcome round to a direct answer to your question. But I remember having a chat with a guy who um, is very experienced in enrollment matters. Mm -hmm. I'm one of these magicians who specializes in figuring out how to get people to come to colleges and universities. And I asked him, well, you know, you know a lot about liberal arts institutions like the one I'm teaching at. What's the main thing that gets people coming? Hmm. And I sit there, you know, waiting patiently for you know some kind of answer, thinking, well, I wonder if it'll be maybe it's natural sciences or maybe it's 
big questions. He thinks about it and he says, Division three sports. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so I, I get that, you know, we institutions need to um, sell themselves, but the, the question is, is what's core to your mission, right? And um, how this is going to impact the other things that you do. Yeah. So for example, I think it's fine um, to have, um, for example, civic engagement on campus. Indeed, I think that's a good thing. And Many colleges, universities have offices of civic engagement. Um, but when somebody comes into the office of civic engagement and says, look, I'm thinking about uh, trying to do some good out there, I would prefer that the civic engagement director not simply say, all right, um, let me help you. Let me give you some material to make signs with. And maybe I'll go out and march with you because that sounds like I'm a pretty good cause. Um, you instead want your civic engagement director to pose questions like, you know, obviously not so bluntly, but to get the student to reflect on, well, you want to do good. How, how do you know what that is? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why are you so confident that you know what's good? And even if you know what's good, how do you know that what you're setting out to do mm -hmm. um, is the best way of going about it? You know, th this is a very Socratic thing. To yeah, go back yeah. from John Locke to Socrates, where Socrates was encountering these people who wanted to be deeply engaged in political life. And he would ask them, well, well, how can you be engaged in political life if, if you can't defend, clarify, expound um, your ideas mm -hmm. about justice, goodness, yeah. and, and, and all the rest of that. So um, it, it seems to me that you know, reasonability, if that's at the core of campus, right? it just needs to fuse everything we do, which or almost everything we do, which means that we can't just be constantly running up different flags and, you know, issuing core value statements that have 10 things, you know, of which one might be something connected um, to being reasonable and sort of unranked way. We have to say, well, this is the main thing we're looking to do. This, this is the central matter Mm -hmm. um, of what we're doing and, and let that inform the rest of what goes on, yeah. um, on our campuses. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's really nice. I, the, it, to me, what you're saying is it just gets at the, the, the unifying purpose, but kind of the whole gestalt of what it means to have a liberal education, right? How does this all coalesce together? Uh, just briefly, you've already touched on it, but, uh, for you, what are the kind of origins in this country, in the United States? Uh, of liberal education, you know, do you put that at lock or do you go all the way back to, I mean, he's, you know, not American, but, you know, how do you put, uh, you know, the origins of it in the United States, you know, is it kind of an import from Socrates and Locke and some of these other thinkers or where it's kind of um, that is, uh, how is, how does it start and originate here? Yeah, so, so in the very broadest way, Right, if we speak, think of, of liberal education, the, the broad way I started out with an education mm -hmm. for freedom, that, that does indeed go back a long way. Right. Um, we can speak a tradition of liberal education going back to the ancients uh, that never altogether um, dies and then is just sort of brought over, mm -hmm. um, you might say. Uh, the, the kind of idea of liberal education that I'm, I'm seeking to defend, which um, you, know, you might call um, uh, Lorraine and Tom Pangle wrote a book called um, something like The Learning of Liberty, and they call this an enlightenment tradition, the kind of thing I'm talking about, where, where the liberal, liberal education involves, above all, um, you might say, freedom from authoritative prejudices, not, not just for, you know, highfalutin philosophers, but, but for citizens, this is a desirable thing. Um, you find that, I think, um, in some of our founders, um, Jefferson's a good example, right? He says of the emerging University of Virginia, and here I'll have to actually read this quote since I haven't memorized it. Please. This institution will be based on the illimitable freedom of the mind, for here we're not afraid to follow truth wherever it may lead, nor to tolerate any error so long as reason is left free to combat it. That captures, I think, an enlightenment understanding of, of, of liberal education. I, I don't think it ever altogether dominates mm. um, our tradition, whether you're talking about the tradition of the, uh, the sort of small college, initially religious, where the aim is really you know, more moralistic than that, um, or the research university that comes later, where the aim is more scattered, 
um, than that. But it's always a part, I think, um, of our educational tradition. The one thing I'd add that I think is, um, if not distinctly American, uh, special about the American tradition, is this idea that, that a high demand is placed on the rationality of, of ordinary citizens, right? So, so in the Greek tradition, to be free means basically, you know, you don't have to work. Um, you know, the, the, the Athenian aristocrats had slaves. Um, to do that work. And so, so, so liberal education really was for aristocrats. Yeah. Um, and the American tradition, you know, it's not certainly not necessarily for everybody. Very few people <laughs> pursued higher mm -hmm. education. And, and even today, you know, maybe 50% of people in the 25 to 34 age group um, have a post-secondary degree right. of any kind. So it's not necessarily for, for everybody, but there is a sense that it is uh, more democratic, that liberal education isn't merely for um, aristocrats or for cocktail parties, but somehow it's connected with what um, citizens are doing from their citizenship work, where a high premium is paced, uh, placed on consent um, to try to figure out when we face a sort of genuine threat to our freedom that we need to be vigilant about, as opposed to a fraudulent or spurious threat, a fairly high degree is placed on the idea that, that, that citizens um, need um, a modicum of rationality to manage. Um, and a guy like, uh, you know, Ben Franklin is somebody, he's really kind of a, a, a minor hero of my book in that, you know, he, on the one hand, you know, he, he makes, just being a reader and being together with other people who are engaged in that activity looked like a wonderful thing, you know, sort of all by itself. Mm. But at the same time, he also emphasizes the utilitarian dimensions of those things that, you know, it's wonderful to do this. And also you might just get rich. And that strikes me as a very American mode of looking at this kind of thing. So, you know, I know you asked me a historical question, but I, I to sort of place myself in the mm -hmm. liberal education discussion. I, I know a lot of people who defend liberal education, especially the humanities, are really concerned about, you know, we shouldn't be, you know, we should eschew those kinds of justifications, utilitarian, vocational ones, and so on. But I think the American tradition is to try to push these two things to, together a bit more mm -hmm. um, than sometimes liberal education's defenders um, want to push them together. They're, they're not the same, right? Mm -hmm. But um, but they're, they're not polar opposites in the American tradition either. Yeah, yeah. I, I like the way you explain that because it it seems to 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 have a mix of kind of its origins, but then also, um, you know, kind of the American uh, angle and how 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 americans you know do it which isn't to put a value statement on it it's just a way of of saying how how it's how it historically has been done yeah and if, if i if i may just one more thing briefly mm -hmm. to, to go back to um to Locke, he also has that sort of franklin thing i'm talking about i mean he is mostly educating gentlemen in some sense his education <laughs> right, yeah. is aristocratic but he says that um his education is suitable for a soul devoted to the truth Right. That, that, that's independent. Right. It's just it's good to be a soul devoted to the truth. This is, you know, human beings can reason. That's something wonderful about them. And so education is for that. But also, right, the education is for people who, who are acting in the world, people of business, so to speak. Right. So, so it's also just an avenue to, you know, not being stupid. Mm -hmm. Right. Not making bad judgments in your practical work. Mm -hmm. Right. So again, you, you, you have this this independence, right? It's, it's good all by itself. Um, but you also have this sense that, well, it's going to be useful. And again, I think yeah. that that is it's not just American, but it, it's mm -hmm. it's an American thing. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I totally agree with you there. What about the terms? So this is a two part question here. So what about the terms um, conservative and liberal? Um, in terms of how you're meaning it. So again, the subtitle is conservative case for liberal education. You know, those are, you know, most people probably think of left, right or Republican, Democrat in the United States. They, you know, maybe some people think of the tradition of conservatism or the tradition of liberalism. Uh, but how are you kind of, I guess, defining those terms uh, for the purposes of the book? And 
you know, why, um, you know, the conservative case for liberal education, excuse me, why not the liberal case for conservative education, I guess you could say. So, so maybe just kind of give the, how you define the terms and then, you know, why you phrase it, you know, kind of that way or what the, the main aim was trying to, um, to get out here. Thanks. Yeah, well, that, that would be a long answer, but at least let me try to answer sure, as much sure. of that as, as I can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so I try, and um, I, I'm very glad I did this. I was actually urged by other people to do it. I didn't initially think hmm. I needed to. But, but in the preface of my book, I just, I just come right out and say what I mean by conservative, right? which mm -hmm. is one slice of the conservative universe. Yeah. I mean, conservatism is, um, in, in America, um, probably everywhere, but in America, is this odd coalition of people who don't agree on very much, right? yes. other than opposition to, um, um, at one time, communism, um, mm -hmm. now a concern about a certain kind of big centralized government, but encompasses people who are, you know, lovers of tradition. Um, it encompasses people who call themselves as, uh, you know, libertarians. They're going to have very different views, right, on the desirability of um, having restrictions on pornography, for example. It, it's an odd coalition. And so when you say conservative, you kind of have to say, well, here's what it is um, as I'm using it. And, you know, what I say, and we've already talked about this a little bit, is that a certain kind of conservative, a real strand um, in America, you know, it's a funny thing, right? Conservative is someone who are looking to preserve a revolution, right? That mm -hmm. is to say, the principles of the Declaration of Independence, the principles more broadly of the founding, understood in a certain way, which I've started to describe as uncommonly open to rational scrutiny, mm -hmm. right? So um, again, Jefferson is helpful um, in thinking about this, and that he says that the, um, the right to the unbounded exercise of reason is going to support the principles of the Declaration. And so there's a kind of ease of fit, yeah. right, as Jefferson sees it, between what I'm calling liberal education, right, and, and civic education, right? Yeah. That those two things go together pretty neatly for somebody yeah. um, like Jefferson. At the same time, like, like many conservatives, I, I have a certain suspicion, right, of the capacity of reason to influence political affairs, right, both our individual and collective capacity to be reasonable. Uh, there are great impediments to this. Um, in the Federalist Papers, the great defense of the American Constitution mm -hmm. almost starts out by saying um, in the very first paper that in this discussion, the one over the Constitution, as in all matters of great national discussion, a torrent of angry and malignant passions will be let loose. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? So th there are profound obstacles um, to, to uh, reasonableness both individually and collectively. And that's a conservative thought too. Um, and, and that's one reason it, it just, it can't be taken for granted, right? You need a kind of institutional home, or at least it helps to have institutional home um, with norms to, to just try your best to do this work of just carving out a space for this, hmm. right? In, in a really crazy <laughs> um, kind of world that we find ourselves in. So th that's what I mean by conservatives. And I do talk about other kinds of conservatives and try to explain why I think that my conception of liberal education is fine for them too. But that's sort of where I stand. And, and then liberal in liberal education, of course, it's not you know, Nancy Pelosi or to date myself, Ted Kennedy, <laughs> um, liberal, right? It's something else in a way is consistent mm -hmm. with what I've just described as conservatism. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to get too, too hung up on it, right? I mean, I think yeah. that, that the liberal conservative distinction is quite, is quite useful, right? I, I mean, human beings are sort of, you know, natural partisans, um, that we speak in terms of liberal and conservative is interesting, right? Uh, if we go back to the ancient Greek world, we'd be Democrats slugging it out with oligarchs. That's not the way our partisanship falls out. So it, it's worth talking about. But the fact is, when I present my argument, um, you know, a lot of conservatives like this argument, mm -hmm. but so do a lot of liberals. <laughs> I've had um, some, though perhaps not as many, I, I have had some, some liberals say to me, well, you know, I, I don't see much in here with which I, I disagree, right? I may disagree with you about, um, you know, healthcare policy mm -hmm. or the appropriate scope of the administrative state and how great a danger it presents to our liberties. But I don't really disagree with you about, so to speak, the enlightenment, right? right? right. Um, so that there are some folks who would describe themselves as um, 
trench, but Anthony Cronman is an example of this. Um, he describes himself as an academic liberal, I'm sorry, an academic conservative um, and, and sort of a progressive or liberal outside of the academy. Mm. So I think a lot of people define themselves as politically liberal or actually academically conservative. Mm. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I could I could see that as as you start to parse these things out, there's certain there's certain things there, you know it, that kind of tracks with how I also read it as well in the book is that you're trying to conserve, you're trying to maintain many tenets of liberalism in terms of our academics and our education that we have, and one of the main features of this is a, a kind of a unified you know emphasis on rationality. Um, and how do we have exchange of ideas and how do people integrate things in a way that uh, has a kind of collective whole? I guess one follow-up I have is, again, just a little bit of a devil's advocate here is, do you know, do you know, you know, we've been talking in, in many ways, these positive ways about a liberal arts education, but is there, have you heard any good arguments about why we shouldn't have a liberal arts education, you know, or, or is there any argument against that of like, well, maybe that's just, we've grown out of that and we're in a new era, we're in a new age, we're in a new century. Maybe we don't need that as much. We need to focus on, you know, outcomes and utility and how do these things work? Or I don't know what the, the argument was, but what would you, have you ever heard any counter arguments to that? Um, that that uh, sure. would, would kind of make that? You are feisty. <laughs> um, so I, I think there are um, arguments against. I wouldn't choose the particular one you um, have just described. Mm -hmm. I don't find that to be a terribly persuasive argument, and mm -hmm. and I'll I'll say very briefly why. I actually talk about it a little bit in the book. Right, there's this justification out there that's usually presented as justification for liberal education that says what we need to do is deal well with complexity. Yeah. Right. And, and it, it, it seems pretty clear that you can't deal well with complexity um, without reasonability um, in the sense I've just described. You, you might be able to deal with it in, in one area, right, if, if you're never taken outside of it. Yeah. Right. If you have a very specific kind of engineering problem, you might be OK. Mm -hmm. Right. But, but even I would say somebody in what sounds like a really specialized pursuit um, like engineering, probably isn't going to do so well without having reasonability in a broader sense. The um, thing I find uh, more convincing, although I don't accept the argument, this argument actually sort of goes back in a way instead of going forward, it is the, the sort of traditionalist argument um, against liberal education, at least as I describe it. And what that says is, well, you know, what you seem to be picturing is some um, you know, free individual kind of floating in the air and looking at a bunch of different arguments saying, well, I want that one, I'll take that one over there and this one over here. And the traditionalist argument is that's just not the way human beings work. Yeah. Um, and it's not healthy for them, right? Human beings are, are attached um, to localities. Um, they're born into all kinds of unchosen um, ties obligations, which can be a problem for them, but from which they also derive sustenance. Mm -hmm. And so the aim shouldn't be exactly um, liberation um, from authority. It should be something else that, that takes into account uh, the power of these local ties, some, something more internal to them. Mm -hmm. you know, so you might imagine something where, where reason still has a place, Right. So, for example, um, I, I was educated um, in an Orthodox Jewish Hebrew school and we played a game called Stump the Rabbi. Right. So we asked a lot of hard questions. We loved this game. We asked the <laughs> rabbi a lot, a lot, a lot of hard questions, you know, about about um, Judaism, the Bible and so on. I mean, that guy was never stumped, but th there's plenty of room, you might say, mm -hmm. um, to think, but, but it was anchored. Right. Um, in a vision of the world that, that was mostly assumed, right? I mean, you could ask some questions about presumptuous basically, well, this is right, and um, we'll reason within those confines. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that's that's a valuable um, alternative view that, that that needs to be taken seriously by by defenders of of, of liberal education. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I mean, I I think. Um... 
Well, you know, I personally think we need liberal arts education. I don't think we should get rid of it. Um, but every now and then I hear people kind of, you know, squabble about that. Like, Maybe we don't as much or we need to just, you know, train uh, specialist only. And, and I actually think the more and more we, we do things in society, we need to have, you know, stronger liberal arts education. So, you know, you and I are uh, singing from the same sheet of music. Um, okay. So you don't let's... want me to sing. <laughs> so let's, let's, uh, pivot to, I mean, one of the, the biggest parts of, of the book and so like the central, I, I, I see it as a central, uh, you know, thesis in your, in your argument is rationality. That's where, um, this is the main ingredient for preserving a, a liberal education. So I'll just start kind of in a general way. What, what do you mean by rationality? Uh, as the aim for educational institutions, uh, or is it one of the main main aims? Um, what is your uh, intention in saying that? Thanks. So, so th th there are two um, ways in which there, I'm sure there are more than two, but there are at least a couple of ways um, to think of what it means to be a reasonable person. Mm -hmm. right. One way is to think in terms mostly of, of skills. Mm -hmm and uh, habits, you know, I'm, I'm just very good at looking at an argument um, and applying appropriate standards. They might be different in mathematics than they are in um, anthropology uh, or psychology, but applying uh, appropriate standards to um, make a judgment about whether a given argument or explanation is you know, relatively strong, relatively weak, um, true or false, if we happen to be in a field where we think we can have that kind of confidence. but. Um, you know, it, it's what, whatever cognitive bundle, right, or, or set of skills that we need to do this is sort of what it means to be reasonable. Uh, and there's something to that, but it's not, it's not the main thing I focus on in my book, because it seems to me that, that these skills are possessed often in frustrating measure mm -hmm. by hyperpartisans and bullshitters and mm -hmm. charlatans and PR reps defending indefensible positions and yes. so on. They're, they're very good at pointing out the holes in relatively strong arguments and making relatively weak arguments seem mm -hmm. as strong as they can possibly seem. Um, and, and I think that, um, you know, it's important to preserve a sense of the distinction between, you know, what, what used to be called, you know, philosophers and sophists, right? That is to say, um, genuine uh, lovers, seekers of truth, and people who are just using reason to get the better um, other people of other people. So uh, to me, the reasonable person is the person who may not even be at the point of um, having tremendous <laughs> skills, um, but they say to themselves and others in a community of people who are striving to be reasonable, um, look, uh, let's stop fooling around. Let's not bullshit. Uh, let's stop trying to puff ourselves up. Let's stop trying to defend our tribe. Um, and let's try to figure out as well as we can what valid or probable conclusions we're able to draw from what we know. Um, and if we don't know enough to draw probable or valid conclusions, what we would need to find out in order to get to the point of being able to do that and let's hold each other to account um, in that regard, right? And that's what I mean by um, a reasonable person largely. It's a person who thinks, again, after John Locke, this is a quote I do remember because it's a quote that I start out my book with. No, probably in a year I won't remember because I don't have a very good memory, but I remember it right now. Um, there cannot be anything so misbecoming this, this is a 17th century English, right? But unbecoming. Sure. Um, anyone who pretends to be a rational creature is not to yield to plain reason and the conviction of clear arguments, mm. right? This is somebody who is willing to and, and actively concerned about turning the tools we usually use to point out flaws and arguments we don't like onto arguments that we do like. I think that your 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 claim of so you you hit it pretty strong in the book and I and I I really um, enjoyed the the argument you make about being reasonable and 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 rational and so 
you know, there's these elements that you say of asking questions, having good arguments, supporting evidence that all of these things are very valuable. These are, these are kind of the, the, you know, ingredients for that. But what would you say about maybe the social aspects of education or is there any role that educational institutions have besides rationality? We can, I mean, I think you and I would agree. I think most people would agree. Everything you're saying is essential. I think it's, it should be at the heart of what um, getting an education in anything, really, it, it should be about. But what about um, other aspects? Uh, social aspects are one thing you could think of, you know, other domains. Um, are there places where educational institutions have any other role besides just rationality? Yes, <laughs> and uh, let, me, let me say a word about that. Um, so the first thing I want to say, though, is the first thing I do is quibble. <laughs> I like that. Um, Go ahead. I'm not sure whether that's reasonable or not, but um, <laughs> my, my, my quibble is, is that I, I think that, that being reasonable is a social activity, right? I mean, maybe it's not, not always much fun, but it is social activity, right? Even when we're sort of uh, you know, sitting around by ourselves. Mm-hmm. Right, we're 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 imagining right other people that we've spoken to. We're thinking in, in in language that we've learned right over the course of time socially, and simply because the impediments to being reasonable are so powerful, it's hard to do without being in a community, mm. right? Of people who are again doing this and holding each other to account. And I go back to uh, Franklin, right? I mentioned him before, and I talk about this in my book, right? This group he was involved in called the um, the Junto, was what he called it. And I love this part of the autobiography and highly recommend it. But, but it is a group of people who are, you know, they're, they're kind of out to advance themselves, but they get together and, um, you know, discuss things they've written on, you know, natural philosophy and other um, kinds of questions and problems. And, you know, it's fun, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it is social. And I, I do think that that um, although not everyone I've ever taught would say, "Wow, that was a lot of fun," <laughs> right. that in, in some sense that that's a, a failure of mine, right? That is to say, I think that part of what we need to do as liberal education is uh, show, you know, in a sense through demonstration mm -hmm. um, in our classrooms, both that this is an activity from which one can benefit. We have to sort of show that. Mm -hmm. um, and also show that there, there is joy in this, mm -hmm. right? Um, and reasoning together with people. I, I know it's not exactly what you meant by social, um, but, but I think it's an important point to make anyway. I don't want to yeah. separate out too much reasoning from, you mm -hmm. know, having a life, right? It, it adds something, it adds dimension to friendship mm -hmm. um, that maybe you didn't think was there or was there only in a sort of uh, foggy way before. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I mean, colleges, uh, there are all kinds of things going on, especially when they're populated by, you know, traditionally aged college students, 18, 22 year olds, right? You know, they're, they're, they're making friends and connections, and this is something that's good to do um, at a residential college. Um, at a college that's heavily funded by the federal government, you know, we're also doing, you know, civic education, right? And people are doing other things that are just uh, of interest to them in life, right? They're, they're involved in clubs, they're, mm -hmm. they're doing sports, you know, if they're religious, they might belong to a religious organization. If they've got a cause, they might belong to a cause-oriented organization. And all of these strike me as good things to be happening at colleges. I mean, you can mm -hmm. imagine a college without these things, but mm -hmm. um, without some of them anyway. But um, mm -hmm but they're good things to be happening at college. So I don't think they shouldn't be happening. I, I just go back to um, what I said before, right? That the whole enterprise is kind, kind of informed by um, this core, right? Again, which I've described as, as reasonableness. Mm -hmm. um, one way of thinking about this, because I, I think it's, that's a little too vague, is, you know, life is going to happen to people. Right? Whether they're sitting on a university campus or they're commuting, right? Life is happening to them all the time. Mm -hmm. Like you sort of imagine this model where, well, you know, you're educated for 16 years and then you go out and live. And that's not the way it works, right? There's not this period where you know, you're educated and you do nothing and then you go out and you do things. Mm -hmm. um, and and what, what, what I think educators can do is, right, we, we can't accompany 
right, our students on important dates and say, you know, remember what you read in the symposium, right? We, <laughs> we can't do that, right? I mean, right. you can't learn how to live in a classroom. You can't learn um, to live out of books. Um, what you can do is um, acquire uh, habits, practices, new ways of looking at things that will inform you mm. as you're doing the rest of your living. Right. One thing that I think it's uh, Rousseau is somebody I've written a lot about, 18th century thinker, closely connected to Locke in some ways, responding to him. But in, in his great book on education, the Emile, he talks about how, you know, people travel is valuable, but mo most people do it too early um, and they're not prepared to benefit from it. Um, and, and that, I think, is actually not a bad way of looking at it, right? Traveling is something that sounds, it's also, even though we send people abroad, it sort of seems like something that happens outside of education, but really, education is preparing you, right, to, to have eyes, right, mm -hmm. and to uh, um, ask questions and, and, and benefit. It's a framework, right, right? that's from, how from, I see from, it. From, from, from travel. Yeah, yeah, I, I see it predominantly as a framework, it's how you conceptualize, it's how you... It's how you're able to put things in a, a grid sounds really static and kind of sterile, but it's a way of, of organizing things. And if you, whatever you may be doing in the world, you have what you're saying, a kind of lens of saying, how do I, how am I able to kind of filter through some ways of approaching novel problems or situations in, in a reasonable way where I can make uh, uh, decisions or for myself or others, et cetera, you know, in, in a, in tandem. So I think that, you know, I think that that's, that's good to, to clarify that, yes, being reasonable is important, but also there are many other things that are important. But I, I, I firmly agree with you that I think that aspect should be at the heart, uh, rationality and reasonableness should be at the heart of, of, uh, of education. Um, so I guess about uh, curriculum here, right? So you say that, uh, you know, as we've been saying, the reasonable person is, is kind of the, the heart of it for training students. But how do we develop a curriculum for the whole person? So not just simply intellectual exercises, which you kind of alluded to. You know, how do we, how do we instantiate that, right? So not just, you know, projects and papers and reading and, you know, classes, but how do we uh, have a, a robust curriculum where that can be potentially applied in, in, in various ways. And that could fall within, you know, particular disciplines, right? So if you're doing engineering, if you're doing mathematics, if you're doing sociology, if you're doing uh, psychology, whatever, medicine, law, how do we, you know, have this element of getting a very robust curriculum together that gives you the basic tools to rationally think through things, but then have kind of more of the, uh, you know, specific or concentrated areas as well. How do you kind of see that in terms of curriculum? Thanks. Yeah. Um, great question. The, um, so I, I just want to start because I, you said something about pre-professional stuff. And I, I do think that, that when we're thinking about trying to defend liberal education, uh, you know, I, I do think that sometimes gets mixed up to the related question of what do we do about the survival of the humanities, which in turn gets mixed up with the question of there don't seem to be enough history majors, what can we do about that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and and I, I don't like to think um, in those terms, even though I, I do very much hope that all these majors will survive in some manner or another. Um, I, I think you're right to think of it in, in a broader way. And, and at the same time also, so to, to both broaden and sort of narrow it, right? So. The narrower question might be, well, I've got all these engineers here. What can I do mm -hmm. right, um, to um, foster reasonableness, you know, as, as, as much as I can understand it yeah. in these folks? And, um, you know, one way is, is simply to, to, to expose them, right? I mentioned that um, comprehensive enlargement of mind means being uh, looking at approaches, right, that you're unaccustomed to or ways of knowing you're unaccustomed to. So... Um, simply taking engineering students and, um, and, and giving them courses um, in areas that are relevant to um, engineering, right? You build things for people, for example, right? Uh, so uh, the humanities might be relevant, uh, psychology might be relevant um, um, to the work of being an engineer, right? Or you do your work in some, some kind of um, context as well. So knowing something about politics, 
might help. Um, there is a, I think it's at the University of Colorado Boulder, they've got a program called the Herps program that, that tries to do something like this. And, um, and, and, you know, one thing you find, you're talking about education of the whole person. I don't think everybody has to do it. It's a program people can opt into, and there seems to be a great appetite for this, actually. Mm. You know, I might expect, oh, you know, they're not going to be interested. They're just engineering types, whatever that means. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a hunger for it, maybe precisely because the, the, this whole person um, thing you describe. Um, more broadly speaking, um, and Ursinus, I think, is a good model for this. Um, you, you want to have a kind of core, I think, um, that is built on, at least this one way of doing it, built on questions that everyone is potentially interested in, right, as a human being, not, not as a psychology major, not as somebody who's determined to become a certified public accountant, no aspersions, my father was a certified public accountant, so no insult attended here. Mm-hmm. I still feel an aversion to the IRS in honor of his <laughs> life to this very day. Um, but um, you know, what questions might we be humanly interested in? Our, our curriculum at Ursinus is focused around questions, at least the core aspect of it. Um, so um, what should matter to me? Um, how should we live together? How can we understand the world? Um, what will I do? Um, those are the four big ones. And then, you know, whether you're somebody who's chairing a department, right, or somebody who's designing a course that's going to fit our distribution requirements, or even whether you're a person sitting in the career development office, mm-hmm. right, or, or in housing, yeah, you're encouraged to think, how can I link back what I'm doing, mm. these enduring questions? Yeah. Right, and the idea is that there really is a a hunger to be tapped out there um, to engage with those kinds of questions and that those questions open out in a helpful way, right? It it may be really my interest in what should matter to me may start out sort of narcissistic, you know, Mm -hmm. what should matter to me, Mm -hmm. right? But there's a way that that question, you know, pushes you out Mm, side of yourself in a way that some other questions might not. Um, so, you know, the short answer is try to design a curriculum about, around humanly interesting mm. questions and things um, and try to have that, that inform everything that's going on. I mean, there are limits to the extent to which it's going to inform Biology 101, although, in fact, I think it does inform Biology 101 the way it's done yeah. um, here at Ursinus. But th- th- that's something that, that one always um, has in mind. How can I bring it back? Mm. again to that, that core that we yeah. keep speaking yeah yeah no that's 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 great what um this is a, a little bit different but um one of the things or i guess i say one of the trends that i'm seeing now is this that more and more people um are abandoning institutions they're abandoning they're, they're all you know, gone to shit, you know, they're all, you know, radicalized or they're all, you know, they're, they're not really teaching anything. It's something I could have just learned on my own or, and you see a lot of these, um, I'm not quite sure what they're called, but you see a lot of these folks that will, will say, well, you know what, you know, here's my, you know, DIY kind of education, right? You don't need a four year diploma. You know, you just, you know, we got, we got Google scholar and we got YouTube and we don't need to do this institutional education. It's just, you know, it's a scam. It's taking all your money. Student loans are a wreck, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a, there's a lot of animus against these institutions now. Um, and I would, I would say, again, how do we, we obviously want self-instruction. We obviously want independent study. We obviously want things that are in some ways individualized to each person of source as best we can. But how can we say that, you know, educational institutions are just as important now as they've ever been and why we still need, that's not the only way, but how can we still um, kind of make that case or that argument for, look, you know, educational institutions have a place and they're very good and they, in some ways, are still necessary to learn many aspects. Um, how do you kind of think about this, this issue? Yeah, boy, Yeah. <laughs> those those punks no um 
<laughs> the um, yeah. So I, I mean, I I I I don't think, and I am going to answer your question. I, I want to begin with that DIY thing because mm-hmm. I do hear a lot about that and. Mm-hmm. You know, people get kind of excited about it. You know, you get uh, newspaper coverage, people give it up on college. And mm-hmm. I actually don't think that's a primary reason that people uh, are giving up on college, N- nor do I think it's a very good reason. I'll explain why in a moment. Um, I think it's a primary reason because I think, I, I think most people who think college is not for me um, think that um, one reason might be the one you mentioned uh, that they, they feel like like maybe it's going to indoctrinate them in some way. But I think much more common than than, than that or the other explanation is I, I can't afford it. Right? Yeah, Even if I yes. could afford yeah. the, the, the tuition, I, I just can't afford not to get right out into the workforce somehow mm-hmm. or another. So, mm-hmm. you know, and, and well, that that's a serious problem. You can't talk somebody out of that. You, you have to right. somehow or another make um, things more accessible, absolutely um, cheaper. Um, I do think it's it's useful to think of liberal education as not simply something that happens um, at four year institutions. I think it's something that absolutely can happen mm-hmm. um, at uh, community colleges. Um, I profile a, a program. Um, it used to be called the Clementi program. I think it might be called something else now. It was started by Earl Shores, and it wasn't initially associated with any academic institution, though later on it became associated with Bard, but it offered a rather rigorous humanities education to people who, you know, were, were barely above um, the poverty level and had, you know, serious um, problems completing the education, but um, nonetheless um, found that education to be you know, just what they wanted. Um, in in many respects. So um, one thing I'd say is uh, don't don't limit your sense of um, higher education to to, uh, four-year institutions. Um, Probably wouldn't be bad. This used to be um, a a kind of tradition to uh, have a bit more interaction between colleges Mm -hmm. and K through 12 institutions Mm -hmm. where students might be able to get a kind of a taste of... um, of, of what this is like. And frankly, I think we could stand to learn something from K through 12 teachers too, right? About how to yeah. um, reach students. So that would be kind of a, a mutually beneficial arrangement. And that also means that even someone who doesn't go on to a four-year college isn't just left, well, I'll watch some videos, right? right? At least they, they've, got, they've got a start yeah. um, in it before they go out and are sort of left to their own devices. Um, I, I really have a problem with the DIY thing, not because I don't think it's possible, mm-hmm. um, but I actually think it is. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, it's great that there are so many opportunities out there um, to learn things. I could spend the rest of my life listening to podcasts like this one, right, and learn a great deal. But um, I, I think that the capacity to just learn all by yourself is very unevenly distributed. Yeah. You know, and, and so these people who are saying, well, you know, um, you know, people should just, uh, you know, they'll learn something on their own, they'll grab a micro credential from this place, and then they'll maybe go abroad to learn mm-hmm. something else, and then they'll learn something on the job. And that actually strikes me as a uh, as an idea of education, it sounds kind of populist, right? I hate big college, capital B, capital C, <laughs> but it is actually really quite elite. I mean, who is capable of benefiting from that stuff? Not very many people, right? Um, in, in, in my view, right? Because the, the capacity to just learn by yourself, that, 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 that ain't easy. I mean, it can be done. I mean, Franklin's autobiography is a model of a guy who trained himself, mm-hmm. but then he went on to found an educational institution, right? The fact that he trained right. himself didn't make him think everybody can do mm-hmm. what Franklin yeah. did. I, I think probably not everybody can. Yeah, my, my pushback on this kind of thing, because that stuff I think is, there's some, there's some positive aspects to it, right? I think, and, you know, but I, I think that there are some things that about it that kind of um, rub me the wrong way. I don't think it has bad intentions, but I just think in the execution of it, it's just not very, um, very good in the long run. And and the first part of that is, 
um, even if you're just doing the information basis of things. Well, education in a traditional sense is not just consuming information. Um, I would say that's half the battle. You're consuming information, you're distilling it, you're synthesizing it, and then you're putting it back out. And you're trying to have arguments. You're trying to reason with your peers and with your superiors or whatever to, to push you and to say, well, did you think about this? Did you think about this? You know, you're just not going to get that from YouTube comments and a Twitter feed, right? It just you know, maybe elements of it, but you're going to, it's not in the same kind of format. And you're not, there's no impetus to try and, and say, well, how do I get this information? How do I understand and comprehend it? And then how am I putting it back in my own words from my own perspective? I just yeah. don't see a lot of that in these DIY places. And, and then the last point is there's also a sense of, um, mentorship supervision um uh there's a there's another word i'm looking for that's escaping me but this kind of training aspect of it that is also i think terribly important now you may get that in some jobs or some things like that but th in terms of having mentorship and, and training and supervision with information with formulating arguments and ideas um, not just the applied pieces of it, I think is also uh, very invaluable from a, you know, educational institution. And so I, I just think those, you know, at least half of the, the answer to this stuff is just not there in a, you know, centralized or even a formal way with some of these, you know, kind of do it yourself uh, uh, programs and things like that. I don't know what you think, but that, that's, no, I think that's right. You know, that that's the, uh, I think you had John Rauch on, on the show before, and that's the value of, of, of having institutions, right? Educational institutions that, um, um, you know, I think even now, and I, I want to come back to, to what, what's good about this point of view, because I, I do indeed think there's something good about it. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think right now there's still a better chance just because of, you know, credentialing in, in academia mm -hmm. that, that your chances of running into a charlatan at a yeah. university, they're, they're, they're a little worse than the chances of running yeah. into one if you're sort of wandering around in the wild west of um, DVDs and the internet. And I'd say a lot better, I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> but right. the thing that, that I think is good about this way of looking at things, I mean, it does keep us um, on our toes in some important ways. And, and, and the question it raises is, you know, are we really doing mm -hmm. what we say we're doing? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, I can talk about reasonableness until I'm blue in the face. It's not a novel idea. <laughs> right. I mean, other institutions say, well, we're going to teach you a critical thing. And then you, you kind of hear about that. You read the brochure, you get there, you know, you go to your first class, there are 800 people in your lecture hall to exaggerate. Mm -hmm. Somebody drones at you for a period of time, then you meet with a graduate student who tries in some manner or another to teach you. You go to a meeting when you're warned against microaggressing too much and you think, you know, this isn't quite what I signed up for. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, you know, sometimes when people criticize universities, um, you know, they're quite right. Uh, <laughs> sure, yeah, sure. Um, you know, and, and one thing is the, the the political thing that you started out with. I mean, this is a, a big part of my book. I mean, one funny thing about response to my books is conservatives read and say, why didn't you attack the liberals more? <laughs> the liberals read and say, why did you focus so much on what's wrong with, with, with the liberals? But the, um, but the, um, and I, I'm, not, I'm not one of those people who thinks if you're being attacked by two sides that you're right. I mean, it may just be yeah. that I was wrong in many different ways, but the, um, <laughs> But yeah, there, there is a part of the book that suggests that that we really need to be much more wary than we are. Yeah, um, yeah. about being identified um, with a political outlook, you know, two scotias to the left of the political view that President Obama used to represent. Mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. I think we're not at all careful about that, mm -hmm. and I think that 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 that's quite dangerous. I mean, we say a lot more. I mean, the pronouncements that issue from presidential offices now are much more social justice oriented, you know, sort of left inflected way than they are about you know, mm -hmm. being reasonable, liberal education, you know, stuff like that. And so it's not surprising that half of the country says, you know, <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure these institutions are doing right. a lot of good. And right. 
Um, so, so I think we do need to, to, to focus on that more as well. So I'd say, you know, reasonableness, I think, is, is, is now I don't know if it's going to work. You know, if, if I knew how to um, get uh, lots of people to fill our seats at colleges and universities, I, I'd be, you know, too busy to talk to you. I'd, I'd have the best consulting business um, <laughs> in, in higher education in, in, in America. But I, I do think two things. I mean, I think uh, this argument about reasonableness, you know, I think it ought to sell. You know, that is to say that um, it has two things going for it. One, um, it really is determinately nonpartisan, at least with respect yeah. to the partisan divisions in our country at the moment, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it may be a fighting creed in some sense or another, but it doesn't map on to um, our politics. And um, the second thing is that that really does attempt to uh, make that sort of, again, Ben Franklin case for usefulness. Again, it's not just like you, you kind of need this as, as a frill in addition to your major, right? It's kind of some icing we're gonna put on the cake of your um, specialized education, right? It, it's something else that you need. I mean, Locke says this, you know, the understanding is, is it's our only recourse in matters that are very important to us. So that's what I think we should be in, say we're involved in, 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 in helping us develop a better understanding, which is another way of mm -hmm. um, saying, uh, you know, trying to uh, bring us into a community that together strives to be um, reasonable. Um, I was also, I, I sort of, at the end of my book, I talk a little bit about Robert Maynard Hutchins. I'm a University of Chicago guy. Um, I went there um, all the way from undergraduate through graduate school. I'm not quite a lifer because I didn't go to the, the, the lab school. It starts in, I think, uh, in nursery school, but I was there for a long time. And sure. Robert Maynard Hutchins is a famous and influential president of um, the University of Chicago. And one thing he says is that, um, you know, in chasing money, right? We need tuition dollars, right? He knows that. He says we need money, but sometimes in chasing money, we 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 lose our souls, mm. right? And so his recommendation is to decide what it is that you think is worth doing, and then try to sell it. <laughs> and uh, you know, but I'm sympathetic with college presidents who feel you know a lot of people are defending on them. Their um, institutions are fragile. They do have to think a little bit more about you know quite directly about how do I sell this at next year? I've got enough students who can continue yeah, to yeah. function. I, I get that mentality, but I think mm -hmm. there is also something self defeating about it. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I certainly think, you know, we, we listen to all kinds of consultants who say what you need to do, right, is, you know, you, you, you need a, you know, a, uh, you need a major in cyber, you know, or something like that. And there's not much evidence that those things work, mm -hmm. right? They're, they're, they're sort of trendy, but, but, but in that sense, you know, better to, you know, get a program that you, that, that you think is good, that's something you want to, something you want to do, that's defensible, that you think that, there are good reasons to think that people might want to do it mm -hmm. um, and, and go out and go out and pitch that. Yeah. Right. I mean, the, the whole book is in a way, right. Intended to say, this is why mm -hmm. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. people ought to want to do this. And in some ways it's pitched, you know, mostly to people already in it, trying to figure out how to justify, but it's also pitched to anybody who cares mm -hmm. um, about higher education, including um, a, a including students. And uh, yeah, it's hard to say if it'll work, right? I mean, if you're yeah. thinking in those terms, will it work or not? I say at the beginning of the book, mm -hmm. I think I say that, um, you know, I, I, I don't think that, um, you know, liberal education is going to fade from the scene, but, you know, in any case, it's better to go down swinging. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. And, and, and that's yeah. that, that's part of the heart of a, of a book. Yeah, no, I... I you know, firmly agree with, you know, with everything you just said. And, and I think that, you know, I have much like you, a big passion for education, big passion for higher education. And um, I, I think your message is super important for people in it, people that want to, you know, are going to go off to college and university. And so uh, I think, again, there's, there's so many wonderful things that you, you have to say. The book is Let's Be Reasonable, A Conservative Case for Liberal Education. Jonathan, this is a blast. I, I greatly appreciate you uh, talking with me about this, talking about the book, and uh, it's just been, it's just been uh, really, really, really awesome. I appreciate it. Thank you, Xavier. This is great. Much appreciated. All righty. Thank you.